We are joined now by Bill Gates, the co-founder of Microsoft, which he began in 1975 when he was 19 years old. He also co-founded the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, one of the largest philanthropic foundations in the world today. They spend billions on global health and use a data-driven approach. The annual Goalkeepers Report has just come out, and it tracks the progress towards the foundation's sustainable development goals worldwide. Uh, Bill Gates, you've joined us before to discuss these issues. Thank you for coming back on The Beat. Great to be here. Uh, really great to have you. Let's dive into the policy here. You basically write about many issues, including uh, the rising maternal death rate we see in some countries, and not just in poor ones. Uh, what is the problem and what are the fixes? Well, the history of global health uh, from the turn of the century is a very positive one. You know, we cut child to death in half and we actually cut maternal mortality during that time frame. But then as the pandemic came along, uh, the focus on funding these health systems, the interruptions meant that this amazing progress actually stalled. Uh, all this time, we've been learning why do these children die, uh, creating new tools. Uh, so here, uh, as part of our goalkeepers event uh, that we do every year around the General Assembly to talk about progress, because uh, the, the world has set these goals to reduce these deaths dramatically. Uh, and so we have new ideas, new ways of uh, getting back on track uh, to achieve the goals uh, that were set for 2030. In the United States, uh, people might be surprised to hear that among rich countries, uh, the U.S. has the worst rate of maternal death, including uh, hitting poor and minority uh, residents the hardest. Um, how do you reverse that? Well, it's a variety of things. Uh, there are clearly social factors. You want to uh, reach out to people uh, so that they're coming to their uh, prenatal visits. You want to make that comfortable for them. You also want to understand the, the medical conditions uh, that are, are prevalent. Uh, some of the tools our foundation does actually will be beneficial, will simplify uh, delivery and improve outcomes in all countries. Um, and so, uh, you know, getting to the bottom of why that's gone up, which, as you say, is very surprising, that'll give us the, the new interventions. Uh, globally, we see about 800 of these maternal deaths per day. Uh, you've always been skilled with uh, the number side, the metrics, but also there's a story to be told here. You had to tell a story of personal computing <clears throat> before people got the vision. Uh, what story are you trying to tell here so people understand this is actually in the fixable dimension? This is not one of these things we have to live with. Well, we talk about the progress that everybody should be proud of, where we got new vaccines out, we got malaria bed nets out. It's this early time period where we've made uh, the least progress. Uh, every death, of course, of a mother or child is a tragedy. So when you start to deal with millions, you know, it can feel very abstract. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so to make it real, we, you know, we want to show the pictures of those mothers and talk uh, about the story of what's going on there. Uh, you know, I think we all should be proud of the generosity, uh, the innovation that got us uh, to where we are. But we shouldn't be satisfied with it. Mm -hmm. um, we can cut those deaths in half again. Uh, you've been on the beat before, but this is our first time in person, partly with the pandemic you just mentioned. So here we are, and you brought something physically to the studio show and tell what is what is this? Yeah, so everything we've come up with, uh, this, the seven new interventions that'll save over two million lives uh, by 2030, they're actually fairly expensive. The one inexpensive, the one you might be surprised at is uh, this is now an ultrasound, which has been a big expensive device, uh, but using mm. chip technology, now it's, it's this little handheld and all of the processing's just on this cell phone. So you can go to a mother who's pregnant and scan with this, and it'll let you know, uh, is this a risky pregnancy? And so if so, you need to get to a hospital-like facility where they can do a C-section, and if not, you can stay in the community uh, and not have to use up those scarce resources. So, it, you know, this alone uh, will save almost a third of those lives that we talk about. Who then operates this, and how much cheaper is it than the, the old big system? Yeah, this will eventually uh, be $1,000 and then even less than that. So if you use it for literally hundreds of pregnancies, 
uh, the cost per pregnancy is, is, is quite good. Another amazing thing is that because the software here is doing the work to look at the placenta, to look at the cord, to look at the amniotic sac, you know, understanding, uh, because we've trained an AI with lots of data about uh, good outcome pregnancies and tough outcome pregnancies, the actual work doesn't require as much training. So uh, it guides you to do the scanning properly and then gives you the information uh, that tells the patient what they should do. Mm, really striking. Uh, in your report, you also talk about trying to save uh, two million lives in the so-called low or middle income countries by 2030, six million lives by 2040. Where does this work fit in against the debates around climate change, which are important and related, but often feel like a distant future? As you know, people in this and other countries say, oh, we got problems right now. Why do I have to worry about that? Um, walk us through that. So climate change, the way we should think about that is it, it makes development harder. It makes it harder to grow your crops and so your kids aren't as well nourished. If you're not as well nourished, you're uh, more uh, able to, uh, vulnerable to die from these diseases. Uh, you're more likely not to develop physically and mentally. And so we need to solve climate so that we can continue this development improvement. Um, that will often mean different seeds that can deal with the heat or deal with the drought. Uh, it'll mean early warning systems for disasters, things like that. But the end goal, which is the, the human condition, you know, we have to put it all together. It's not just climate's over here and health is over here. The two are interacting, and if we don't act uh, on both of those, we won't have this improvement, which is what we really owe uh, to people in, in developing countries. You're also deeply involved in this field of artificial intelligence. Uh, you were just in Washington meeting with Senator Schumer and tech leaders about how to regulate this correctly or how to find the balance. You've also said uh, that you think this AI revolution is as big as the personal computer or the internet itself. Um, what can you tell us about that meeting? How do you do this in a good way, and what do you mean when you recently were writing that AI can actually help with both health, which we just discussed a little bit, and global education? AI is, is going to change jobs in a pretty dramatic way. It's gonna make people more productive uh, and help out. So yes, this is a uh, world-changing set of advances. Uh, you know, AI didn't used to be able to read and to write, uh, and the open AI chat GPT a milestone is the first time we've seen that. And so it will allow doctors to do less paperwork. It'll help teachers with homework. It'll, um, you name a job, you know, lawyer, architect, uh, it'll uh, find information for you more quickly and hopefully get rid of the dull parts of the work. And who really needs lawyers? <laughs> uh, unfortunately, well, uh, it's part of our society. So uh, <laughs> helping them do their job better is, a, uh, is, is quite worthwhile. Uh, you know, programmers are already having the AI suggest the code, help them debug uh, things. And in areas like health and education, we have a shortage. You know, we can't tutor right. every child. We can't be personalized to their needs. You know, even the feedback on their homework isn't as extensive as we'd like. So uh, the Gates Foundation has partners like Khan Academy who are already rolling out uh, the first efforts for a personal tutor. I thought uh, Senator Schumer calling that group together was fantastic because we had about 30 senators in the audience, and actually in this case, they were sitting and learning. And you know whether it's health or education or uh, the military, AI is going to be applied in all those areas. So the sooner our representatives personally are playing around with it, getting a sense of what is it good at, what is it not at, the, the better job they're going to do updating the policies. Did you see a learning curve in that room? Well, definitely. I mean, the first time you see this demo where it can create images or, you know, write uh, things or, uh, you know, even what they call deep fakes where it can make something that looks real, you know, it sounds like a person speaking, yeah, even when it's not them. Uh, you know, you've got to see it to really get into your head that we've come a long way and there'll be a mix of people trying to use this for bad things like cyber attacks 
and uh, hopefully dramatically more uh, where it improves education and improves health care. Yeah, you say you got to see it to believe it and that it is writing. Uh, we have some newly written AI for you, and maybe you can tell us how it holds up, but it's from Chat GPT, which is part of OpenAI, which you're behind. Um, and this is about Bill Gates. Uh oh. But, but you can fact check it. <laughs> At Harvard, Gates envisioned a world where every desk harbored the potential of a computer. His precocious dropout in 1975, accompanied by Paul Allen, resulted in the birth of Microsoft. Today, with over 75% of the world's PCs running on Windows, its influence is incontrovertible. In 1995, fewer than 1% 1 of the world had Internet access. Microsoft's innovations, including the Windows OS and Internet Explorer, played a pivotal role in making computing and the Internet synonymous with modern life. Uh, the AI goes on to say, A fiercely curious individual with an almost voracious appetite for knowledge, Gates is known to devour books on diverse topics, underlining key sections and making marginalia. His character isn't without criticisms, the aggressive business tactics of Microsoft in the 1990s, the antitrust litigation, and the complex interplay of wealth and influence. Yet his later life sees an evolution from a ruthless tech magnate to a global philanthropist. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation dispersed over $50 billion in grants since its inception. The foundation's footprint is vast, from providing 2.5 billion children with life-saving vaccines to investing upwards of $1.6 billion to combat COVID. In an era marked by skepticism towards billionaires, Gates emerges as an enigma driven by a belief in making the world better. And quote, uh, one to 10, what rating would you give that AI work? Well, I, I'm biased. It sounded good to me. <laughs> Actually, good. the facts were, were quite good. Uh, we are still working from time to time. The AI will get make mistakes on facts. And yet, I, as I see the researchers probing to when that happens and why, you know, we hope, particularly in areas like healthcare, where accuracy is so important, uh, we hope to get rid of that. But in this case, in fact, I didn't hear anything that uh, sounded wrong. So, again, you talked about uh, enhancing or supplanting writing. You found this to be high quality. Yes, I did. Yeah. And so can you explain to us how that works? We hear language model. We hear artificial intelligence. How does the model make what we just heard about you? Yeah, the actual math of what's going on is very complicated. You know, still, Steve Wolfram wrote a book called How ChatGPT Works, and I recommend it. Uh, but, you know, even he, one of the uh, great mathematicians there, says, uh, like everybody who's involved with this, the way that it's actually representing knowledge, we don't fully understand. We know how we trained it and made it guess and fill things in. We know how it figures out words of speech, but the fact that it's so good, uh, the exact specifics of where, how it's storing things, uh, we're still researching uh, that. And So and we teach it, but then it teaches us. Yes, uh, but it's not perfect yet. Yeah, well, that goes to something that you and others have warned about. You mentioned the meeting with the senators. It seems there's a version of this where humanity gets it right. We use this for good things. You just spoke about that. There seems to be a version where you've talked about the bad guys get it, and that part of humanity that we're concerned about uses it for ill. And then there's the third doomsday we hear about, and maybe it's sci-fi movies, that it becomes a powerful bad guy. And I want to play a little bit of, of Mr. Altman, who's testified and who runs OpenAI currently, and Brad Smith from the company you founded, uh, about this. Let's look. If this technology goes wrong, it can go quite wrong. Uh, and we want to be vocal about that. We want to work with the government to prevent that from happening. We need a safety break, just like we have a circuit breaker in every building and home in this country to stop the flow of electricity if that's needed. Is that part of what you're recommending, or what do we do to deal with that doomsday risk? Yeah, as the current AI doesn't represent that risk, but what we've seen is the improvement, the rate of improvement in the AI is fast enough that if that continues, we're going to have such a powerful tool that we need to make sure that uh, its intent uh, is under control uh, and that it's for the good of humanity. And so even though we don't have the dangerous AI, the fact we're already talking about, OK, uh, what should the rules be and how should these things be looked over and how should they be designed? There's a whole new field now called AI safety. Uh, it's at its very beginning, 
But I think it's wise that we're engaging the government, not just the U.S. government, but all governments in this dialogue when there's still uh, quite a bit of time uh, before the AI gets to be uh, super powerful. Mm. Really, really interesting from you. Uh, before we lose you, I did want to ask you about labor and all these strikes. You're in your philanthropy mode. Um, but as you know, there's rising concern about the pay gap. Uh, we've got a strike in auto. We've got a strike in the creative field, which relates to AI. Uh, we've got a lot of questions about tech, uh, wealth. Uh, my basic question to you, and we've touched on this before, is when we see the ratio that used to be 20 to 30 times CEO to worker, and now it's three or 400 times, is that a problem? Is it something the government should address? Um, and what do you say, frankly, to your fellow billionaires who maybe aren't giving out as much as you are uh, at a time of rising inequality? Well, there's several things uh, that are important there. The, the U.S. tax system, in my view, should be more progressive. Now, the Congress gets to decide, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, things like, uh, you know, higher rate of taxation as you get up uh, to very high levels are, are not treating capital gains so specially. So there's tax policy, which is to get resources in the hand of the government. Whatever's left over after uh, the more progressive tax system, I do think philanthropists, having that wealth go towards philanthropy, where you can uh, prototype new curriculum or you know, new ways of helping in the inner city or new ways of saving mothers' lives, uh, I think that's incredibly beneficial. So, you know, I certainly do my best uh, to encourage people to be philanthropic, make that a, a journey where they take all the skill that let them uh, accumulate wealth and give it back to society. Um, and I, you know, that's, that's my full-time work now. Yeah. Um, in closing, I'd love to do the quick lightning round. We've done that on remote. It's actually easier in person, <laughs> person to person. This is in a word or a sentence, uh, if you can. In a word or a sentence, uh, success at these development goals would mean? I, it would mean no unnecessary deaths. Um, you know, mothers and children, you know, we, we're a very rich world. We can apply our IQ uh, and, and, and solve these problems. We've made progress, but not enough. The best part of the personal computing revolution is? Uh, it empowered people to learn more. Uh, let us, uh, you know, write out our ideas, research information. Uh, let us be more intelligent. The worst part of social media is? Well, we can have people cluster who, you know, are kind of outraged and they just get more outraged and they don't necessarily uh, share the same set of facts. So it's kind of splintered people that, you know, okay, I just hang out with people who believe in QAnon or I just be, hang out with people who have these other views. You know, the the having a few news channels and the newspaper, we were all kind of dealing with the, the same set of facts. And so that fragmentation, how we avoid that uh, as a negative factor, I, uh, I'm deeply concerned about that because I think it partly reflects uh, how our politics have become more polarized. Yeah. Uh, the best part of dropping out of college was? Uh, you know, working with Paul Allen and other brilliant people to uh, get to be part of the PC internet revolution. Uh, last two. The one thing I wish I knew when I was starting out was? Mm. I've learned a lot about, uh, you know, managing people with different characteristics. I, I, I started out only being able to mostly manage people who were like my South. So uh, I think there's a lot of maturity that comes with age, having kids. Uh, you know, and I, I think I've, I've learned quite a bit there. Hmm. And the future of technology will be? Uh, amazing, profound, uh, potentially very positive. Uh, Bill Gates, thank you for your time and for coming back on The Beat, sir. Thank you. Great to see you. Thank you.